liar. Everywhere. On NetRoopsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Friday. Woohoo! It's Friday. That's all the energy I have left to celebrate the fact that it's Friday, but uh, okay. You know we can deal with this sort of stuff. Friday, January 21st. Oh, January 21st. That I can't handle. All right, that's it. I'm leaving. Uh, hmm, all right. Oh, yes, I forgot to tell you what year it is. It's January 21st, 2022. All right. Let's see what you do with that information. I don't know why it's so important for me to tell you every day. Oh, yes, right, to tell you that it's not a rerun. But if you don't tune in for this exact moment in the show, then you'll never know. Okay. Well, with that out of the way, uh, what the hell can we do with our time? Well, of course, plenty of stories, uh, many of which you will need to know in order to survive the weekend. And uh, dramatic music ensues at this point. But if it does, then our little pleasant background fade-out music is cut off. It's very rough on the ear. We won't go with it that way. But, uh, all right, let's see what uh, we have in mind for you today. I'll ask someone else. How about Bill? You can tell us what we're doing today, or maybe not. Kegro in the Morning Radio Show is live now. Kegro X, that's me. Hello, I'm David Waldman, your host. Claims it's Friday. I have done that. Others disagree, and we'll have to leave it there. And we should, and we're out of time. (laughs) And uh, that's it for the show today. But we've given you the news. It's Friday. Everything else would be under dispute. And, of course, a controversial topic uh, widely, uh, widely, what controversial, widely discussed and uh, highly controversial. I can't say it. And of course, if there's some chance that telling you it's Friday, January 21st, 2022 would upset a white person in Florida, apparently I'm not allowed to talk about that. So my, my, uh, podcast will be banned from Florida. Uh, another one of the incredible, uh, overreach weirdo Republican fascist type laws that they're at least contemplating down in Florida. I don't know if they've actually gotten as far as voting on this thing yet. And we ought to distinguish, I suppose, between what they contemplate and what they actually can accomplish. But uh, it has occurred to me actually in the last day or two that there are a couple of uh, Republican projection reversals that we should be looking out for. Um, my guess is, uh, you know, as uh, we often say, they will uh, sometimes accuse the other side, in this case, Democrats, of doing the very thing that they either have just been caught doing or fear being caught doing, and they assume that everyone's doing it. So, uh, you know, we'll we'll see exactly whether these things come to pass. But I think there's also a play of a reverse projection where they actually do a thing and then we say, look, they're doing it. And then they say, no, 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 you're doing it. I, I think that uh, we can anticipate a couple of those. Uh, yesterday, when we were digesting the fallout of the latest kind of sort of fight over the filibuster, uh, it occurred to me, and I think after the show, it occurred to me that uh, – in thinking through, well, how will they defend themselves on things like this? Or what if uh, what if Republican voters actually cared about something like this? I mean, they, they can largely ignore it. But I guess facing maybe Democratic voting constituents back in their districts, even if they're overwhelmingly Republican districts, could accuse them of, you know, well, uh, as, as Democrats, well, I should say as Democratic strategists say, some Democratic strategists say they plan to do to push Democrats to uh, hit back, to attack Republicans over their opposition to protection of voting rights. And lots of Democrats during their speeches during the past couple of weeks and, you know, uh, especially in the last day or so of the big fight uh, were appalled or, you know, appeared to be appalled anyway in their speeches that how could they do this? Uh, I never thought I'd live to see the day when Republicans wouldn't defend the right to vote in this country. And of course, we thought, uh, of course, you'll live to see that day. You were born during that day. But OK, anyway, uh, 
it occurs to me that they will just go home and just say the opposite of what happened, right? I mean, nothing prevents Republicans from going home and saying, or, or you know, they might take a, a slyer, more, you know, crafty approach and say, well, you know, Democrats, they keep attacking us for this. Or, you know, maybe if someone says, what do you say about this thing where Democrats say you were blocking voting rights protections, you can they they will likely say, look, there's no conspiracy to prevent people from voting. Uh, the Democrats are in love with their own rhetoric. They love to say, oh yeah, there's a a Republican party wide multi state effort to undermine uh, voting, undermine our election system, and confidence in our electoral system, and and to reverse the electoral college and allow the state legislatures to overrule the will of the voters and cast electoral votes uh, the opposite way and all this stuff. I mean, gosh, doesn't it sound just so crazy? There's no conspiracy to do anything like this. If there was, we would have done something about it. The United States Senate isn't going to sit around and hear about plans to undermine democracy and Republicans will sit on their hands and do nothing. If that had been the case, if there really were such a plot, the U.S. Congress uh, would have responded. We would have done something about it because, of course, we're all for freedom and the right to vote. And, of course, you know, then the, the Democrats in the crowd will say, are you crazy? There was a bill on the floor of the Senate that would have prevented all of this from happening. And not only did you vote against it, you voted to filibuster it. So it wouldn't even come up for a vote to which they'll say, no, 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 no. That was that was the terrible Democratic bill. They were trying to do that. They were the ones trying to steal and rig the elections. I voted to stop them. I'm a hero. That's the true story of what happened. You just don't understand the mechanics of it. It's a very complicated thing. Arcane Senate rules. And they were trying to pass a law that would allow Democrats to steal the election and pin it on Republicans. But I stopped them. And similarly, in another vein, I imagine... Uh, watching Charles Gaber this morning, uh, once again, uh, well, once again, circulating uh, articles by traditional media journalists coming around to the realization that COVID is killing Republicans and in particular Trump voters in numbers far in excess of anyone else. And, and it seems to be zeroing in on these. He's got county level data on this, that the reddest counties, the Trumpiest counties in America have the highest death rate from COVID. And there are a lot of factors that go into that, including, uh, as he acknowledges, uh, Trumpy voters tend to be older, and that tends to be a complicating factor with COVID and COVID deaths, but they also tend to be unvaccinated and anti-vax in many cases, and anti-mask and anti-mitigating anything. Uh, so yeah, it seems to be hitting them harder. And uh, I assume that eventually they'll have to take note of this. And I guess for now they're denying it and just saying it's not true or not acknowledging the, the news about it at all. But eventually, if it were to sink in with them and they would realize that they've been, you know, devastated by this virus and it's only hurting them and killing them, but only hurting them, you know, in electoral uh, in the electoral sense, because that's all we care about, right? Chuck Todd would say, well, but you're going to lower turnout in these districts. Well, yeah, but you're also going to bury 10% of the district. They're going to be dead. Oh, that's actually a bigger deal. Well, yeah, but what does it mean for the horse race? Well, okay, fine. I'm actually perfectly willing to analyze it in that uh, context, sure. But at any rate, I'm thinking that once they realize what's going on, they'll eventually just say, uh, Biden has been targeting us. Look at what he's done to us. He's using COVID as a biological weapon against us. It's a plot to kill us. And it, and he's only doing it because he's such a sore loser and a big man baby and totally uh, unqualified for the presidency, which is, of course, exactly you know how he described Trump in his initial reaction and in his dealing with the virus. But he course, we were also getting reporting uh, out of the uh, White House press corps that Jared Kushner was encouraging Trump to actually do that and say it's only hitting the blue states. So forget it. We won't respond. Let him let him die. 
And then, of course, it came back to haunt them, uh, as it has with the subsequent waves of the variants, both Delta and Omicron. Uh, Omicron making its way out of the Northeast Corridor, the Trump, uh, whatever you would call them, I guess, uh, COVID denialists spent the last couple of weeks pointing and laughing. And okay, fine, fair game. We point and laugh at the anti-vaxxers who find themselves in the hospital and then yeah, some have a change of heart, some don't. Uh, but they were pointing and laughing and saying, look, this is the final proof that the Florida approach, the DeSantis method works. We say to hell with the masks, to hell with the vaccine. None of it works anyway, so forget it. And look, we here in Florida aren't getting hit with the initial wave of Omicron, the very initial wave. It's happening in, in New York and New Jersey and in the Northeast where they're so conscientious about masking and vaccines. Well, of course, Omicron didn't really care that much about the vaccines and not that much about the masks either and was perfectly happy to infect anybody that it could, which meant that it would eventually get to Florida. And it did uh, on the early side and started to hit Florida hard too. At which point the rest of the country said, look, you know, somehow, of course, this is still proof that the Florida method works. Yeah, they're on fire with Omicron and so is New York. But somehow, uh, I don't know, it's all the New Yorkers who are going down there for the winter. That's the problem. And then, uh, sure enough, the purpose of my illustrating for you nightly where the hot spots are by daily new case reports and then illustrating that with a map that lights up those top 10 states in red is that you can see the migration of the virus out of the Northeast Corridor and its dispersal across the country and, and it will park itself in the places where Omicron hasn't been rampant and become rampant. And then that'll ratchet things back up and, uh, well, the red counties will pay the price again eventually. But in the meantime, uh, yes, it also leaves, the spikes also leave troughs in their wake, of course. And one of the interesting side effects of having a big spike, a big wave of Omicron is that if you also report the states that are reporting the lowest numbers of new cases per million on a daily basis, you'll find that the states that were lit up red last week and earlier with Omicron are now turning blue on that second map that I do with the lowest day over day numbers. Uh, it's done its damage and it's found its limits of being able to penetrate the vaccine defenses and the natural immunity defenses, whatever they may be, and is moving on to more fertile ground where there are more targets and leaves behind uh, on my maps a blue wake behind it. We saw it also happen with Delta for a while when Delta really swept through the deep south and turned those. I mean, that was the reason I originally used those colors, red and blue map. There were several weeks uh, after it had washed over the northeastern corridor, it was obvious when I started doing those maps, the deep south was lit up red with the highest day-to-day -day new cases per million and the northeast blue. And then when uh, the wave began to subside and just a little before the break of Omicron, uh, things started to flip. And so the northern part of the map heated up red and the southern part of the map cooled off blue but it was also end of summer and early fall when temperatures reversed essentially in terms of uh, the conditions for the spreading of COVID the things that drive people indoors as it cooled off in the north and outdoor dining was less and less an option things started to heat up in terms of disease transmission and the south could linger outdoors into early winter and that had an effect. Then the Omicron wave came and moved the red spots, not only north, but back to the, towards the east. Now they're dispersing out. They're finding their way back down to the deep south. And the northeast corridor cools off and posts some of the lowest numbers in the country. Of course, the lagging indicator, as Greg has always described to us, of deaths now washes over those blue states, the states that are posting the lowest 
numbers in terms of new cases day by day, new cases per million, are also at the same time posting the highest number of new deaths per million. So that's what comes with the trough. You get the blue trough and you cool off and your rates of transmission are much lower, which is great because everybody has to go out and go to funerals and you hopefully won't transmit the virus while you're there too. So that's one of the unfortunate side effects, but that's one of the things that the maps illustrate. I never did do maps for new deaths. That didn't really make a great deal of sense uh, too late by that point. But that's sort of the way the cycle has gone. Uh, then I started putting the hotspot maps together one year, uh, one year ago and the current day and comparing geographically where the hotspots were. Uh, sometimes it matches up pretty close. Sometimes it doesn't, but it usually, it appears to be the, the, the whole point of that experiment is to see whether it's predictive in any way, whether, uh, the fact that the hot spots were in this region at this point last year means that we will see the same regions light up again, either now or in a couple of weeks. It's a little difficult to tell, of course. The virus isn't, of course, sentient. It doesn't have a travel itinerary. But I was just sort of wondering whether uh, if there really were regional uh, differences in weather conditions that made it more or less likely for virus transmission in certain areas, well, we might see the same things light up again. Eh, hard to tell. There's only 50 states to choose from. Maybe not a big enough sample size. At any rate, that's what I've been doing, watching the maps, and that's what I'm predicting in terms of Republican hypocrisy in the next couple of weeks. Uh, simply uh, saying that, of course, there's no grand conspiracy to steal the election among Republicans, because that's what Democrats do. And I did see, as a matter of fact, yesterday, uh, Brad Raffensperger, for some reason, on Fox News, where I, I guess I thought he would be persona non grata and they would be, like to be rid of him. Uh, small video clip, so it's difficult to tell about the full context of the interview, but appearing on the Fox News air to say that uh, it is Democrats who are, as he says here, quote, the party of stolen election claims. That it's Democrats who are always going around saying, oh, the election was stolen, the election was stolen. Of course, you know, it's been a, several years of the opposite claim and that uh, Donald Trump has done nothing but claim the election was stolen. He, he claimed 2016 was stolen from him and that he would have won the popular vote had that not been stolen. So, and of course, he, you know, set the whole narrative up uh, anticipating a loss in 2016 uh, and then... Miracle of miracles, he lost the popular vote overwhelmingly, but was swept in by the Electoral College, which was a great institution then. And now, of course, it's a disaster and needs to be reformed state by state, as you can see. Well, what a thing to say, Brad Raffensperger. Briefly, you know, considered like an, maybe even an admirable Republican for holding the line. But as I've always said, my feeling was that he always would have gladly indulged Trump in the theft of Georgia's electoral votes if he thought he could have done so without getting himself indicted. And that once Georgia changed the law, he would have been, you know, had they done it earlier, he would have been happy to assist Trump in everything that he wanted. And I guess uh, some of that gets revealed in, in this little snippet being circulated online. I guess I better put that aside, park it in pocket so I can show you. Uh, let's see, other things to catch up with this morning. Ah, yes, Truro Renfro uh, noting that he is devastated about meatloaf's passing, which ordinarily is the sort of, uh, you know, toilet talk we don't uh, engage in here. But, uh, but not meatloaf, not mom's meatloaf, and it's passing through your digestive system. We're talking about meatloaf the guy. The singer, the actor, the multi-talented and uh, lately rather Trumpy guy who may have, perhaps through his politics, wandered into anti-vaxism. I can't confirm that, but he has died of COVID. So there you go. He says, I'm truly, de Truro Renfro says, uh, he's truly devastated about Meatloaf's passing, but heartened to remember that when his politics started to stink, his voice followed. Is that right? Well, here he is at a Romney rally, and he invites us to watch on YouTube. 
And, uh, well, it's in the KITM hashtag column, so go and seek it out. And, uh, yeah, maybe I'll give a listen to it later on. But, uh, well, I, if it's not good, you know, who wants to hear that? Anyway, plenty of other things to catch up on as well. Um, by the way, I guess we can uh, I can run down the KITM hashtag list in reverse chronological order and get to people who have been waiting a long time to bring up various stories or comment on stories that we've handled over the past couple of weeks here. Uh, let's see. Uh, first of all, let's see. At least uh, two people have commented about the 5G airport issues. Uh, first up here, uh, Matthew Rigdon, who said just the other day, tweeted over here. Um, no, let's see. It's a whole thread here. Last night. Uh, oh, it's only two. It's easy. Last night, wondering about 5G airport issues, I stumbled across this website. Uh, it's airlines.org. And of course, pointing to a specific article. You don't just go to airlines.org and take a look. Oh, but uh, it won't help you anyway because there's something wrong with that URL. And I'm seeing just their, their 404 error message, which says we are experiencing delays, which is funny for the airlines thing. But I guess uh, it, was an, it was anyway a 5G FAQ. That's not a weird code or anything. Uh, you know, frequently asked questions about 5G. I wonder if their uh, main page can bring me to it. I don't know if it's going to be immediately obvious. Mm, but maybe just they changed the uh, the URL on it. I don't know. Well, they, they do have something uh, up front on the front page uh, that says, Airlines for America, which they have code for that too, A4A, get it? A4A urges immediate government action to address 5G-related flight disruptions. Uh, but let's see what Matt had to say about it. I guess the first, oh, good, I'm glad since it's gone, he quoted some of it to us here, so we can still read it. One of the, I guess the first FAQ, or at least the first one Matthew liked enough to grab for us. A lot of people say, 5G rolled out overseas, so it must be fine. As the page I linked to shows, oh well, the 5G rollout in other countries is different. And secondly, in other countries, towers around the airports have to run at lower power to reduce interference. In some countries, like France, oui, oui, in France, the antenna are pointed downward to help alleviate this. So it's not an apples and oranges comparison. Okay. Well, I like both apples and oranges. Okay, that's interesting. So definitely people are experiencing this difficulty elsewhere. And, and they've, I guess, found some relief in pointing the antennas downward. I guess we could try. Have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? I don't know whether they've tried that one, but I'd like to suggest that and bill them for the suggestion as well. Uh, let's see, where else was the... Or was I contact? I think through the Daily Coast mail system, uh, I've got a note on it from our Daily Coast friend, San Francisco SF Bay Transplant, who listens to the show frequently and comments very often through the Daily Coast mail rather than online or, on, or rather on Twitter. You can't blame anybody for avoiding Twitter these days. Uh, just noting. Uh, I don't work in cellular or airports, but I am a techie and I can make an educated guess on what happened with 5G and airports. Ready for this one? My team is behind on long planned projects because of the unplanned or urgent support time provided to quickly setting up remote workers, COVID and vaxxed and testing sites, etc. Somebody created that order a test website in a hurry. Conditions keep changing rapidly. Think last July and the 180 degree turn with the emergence of Delta. Now it's Omicron. Every day is a new adventure. So some of the long planned projects have fallen down the list. So, okay, could that be it? Uh, or at least the, the reaction to or the slow reaction here in the United States to a known issue, as they like to say, with 5G and airports, just that the people who would otherwise deal with it are 
either sick with COVID or have other greater priorities because too many other people in other sectors are sick and they're trying to create technological fixes to the fact that they're all out or whatever. I guess just uh, the supply chain for tech work exists too and is likely to be disrupted by, oh, I don't know, a global pandemic or something like that. So that's a good point and a pretty good educated guess. We'll take that and run with it. Let's see. Uh, I know there's more and I should just keep scrolling back and taking a look. Hmm. Let's oh, asparagus zucchini yesterday sharing excess mortality data. Uh, let's see, excess mortality having come up on the show yesterday. He's sharing this from GitHub. Let's see, based on world mortality data set. So we can take a look at that. Uh, nice work by, ooh, who are we uh, linking to? Dmitry Kobach or uh, Hippodoid. <laughs> Hippodoid? Is that right? Hippopehep. Hippopedoid, I don't know how you would pronounce that, but uh, it's easier just to call him Dimitri, I would think. So what is the nice work here? Let's take a look uh, at our chart and blow it up daily. Reported COVID-19 deaths and forecasted excess deaths until January 18th. The United States oh, way up at the top there, although it looks to be that we would uh, be exceeded by excess, in excess deaths by Russia in their projection, the forecasted excess deaths, and I guess they are under-reporting all of the deaths of all kinds in Russia, and I'm sure that's, uh, on the one hand, probably uh, intentional, and on the other hand, probably also a bureaucratic snafu. They were never good at handling paperwork. But the United States, Brazil, India, and Russia, then uh, all up at the top, followed by Mexico, Peru, which has been hard hit for a long time and changed its reporting status. Uh, I don't know. I, I hope they're not under-reporting because they are astronomical in their death rate. All right, that and much more catch-up work to do after this. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show. You know where we are. We're here on Netroots Radio. You know that by now. All right, let's see. Other things I uh, have missed in the past couple of days and should take the opportunity to bring up and credit for all the people who sent it along. Let's see. Oh, yes, right. I did notice this one the other day and didn't get a chance to bring it up. Hawk River, our good Twitter friend and fellow listener, uh, now under the handle, anyway, of left hand of snarkiness, or snarkness, no I in that one? Okay. I guess I artificially inserted that one. But Hawk River on Twitter and uh, commenting here that uh, we have another Hope Hicks, how does she do it story on hand. I missed uh, the opportunity to announce this earlier. Let's see, what have we here? Um, the new Celebrity Big Brother House. Meet all 14 celebrities entering the Celebrity Big Brother House. Uh, I have uh, no idea anything about the 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 show i've never actually watched it but i i got the idea it's one of the old timey uh original uh reality shows and i guess she's one of them and i don't know if i know any of the other so-called celebrities but that's not new that has been happening to me for a long time so i don't know who any of these people are with the exception of hope hicks but it's kind of a funny thing and i guess it fits right didn't let's see um there was at least two of them on Dancing with the Stars, right? Um, although I guess if you go further back to other Republican kooks, you had, wasn't Bristol Palin on Dancing with the Stars too? Anyway, 
Uh, but Rick Perry did it, and then um, what's his name? Sean Spicer did it, and they've been on various uh, stupid shows. And then what? I think uh, what uh, Sarah Palin did like what the Masked Singer one or something. Anyway, now Hope Hicks, which you know whatever she needs to get paid, so fine. She's in the the Big Brother Celebrity Big Brother house. That's hardly a celebrity. Anyway, it's just kind of funny. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. This, just weird and creepy that that would actually ever happen. But uh, what can we do? Celebrity culture. We made one of them president. So, oh, yeah, right. That should be viewed the other way, right? Remember, there was another one where a president did a reality show. It was called The Apprentice, right? Uh, he did them in reverse, of course, the opposite order. But, you know, uh, it should surprise no one, I guess, then the people exiting his administration would would try to do the same thing. Let me get some of that reality show TV money. Uh, I guess also <clears throat> I should acknowledge that uh, <clears throat> I should acknowledge that this frog in my throat will not leave today. Cannot be dislodged, despite the uh, the fact that I do have some of Scott's uh, gifted tea on hand. Thanks again, Scott. Uh, maybe that's doing it. I was perfectly fine before I got on here and had to say anything. Patrick Snyder, who sends items all the time, really... Um, we haven't paused to read any of them separately. They've more or less, uh, it's either stuff that I, it either happened that I'd already kind of wandered into or covered, but it's sort of has provided a lot of background material. The, the, the contributions that he's made things that, um, came up as peripheral to other stories that we were already doing and informed the discussion on them. Uh, like the fact that, New uh, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin had removed the diversity, equity, and inclusion section of the Virginia governor's website. And I think we did make mention of that as part of his overall, you know, sweep of uh, purported executive orders on the first day of his term in office. Um, there were a few other things, just scrolling further back. Uh, an interesting thread that he sent along from a doctor, I guess, discussing the experience of treating a COVID denialist who then has a deathbed conversion and, and you know, and that's nice and everything. But the, the job of comforting this person through the inevitable death from this, even as they begin to realize the mistake that they've made and as Patrick puts it, this is a thread showing how clear and accurate information is cent a central component of an effective response to a pandemic and the deliberate dissemination of pandemic disinformation has life and death consequences. We all know this and should be criminalized. And I'll agree with the sentiment there. Uh, let's see other uh, uh, tweets of the last couple of days and weeks that he's uh, passed along interesting background information on the setup of the filibuster fight but i just wanted to credit him for sending good and timely information that helps shape the show as you all do even if it doesn't always uh, end up being called out uh, in particular at the time and read aloud as a thread so keep the comments coming i appreciate it and of course if you also are following along on the KITM hashtag, you will have seen these things and your own discussion and knowledge of these things will be uh, enhanced by what each of you are hoping to share with me. Even if I don't get to share it with you over the radio, that information makes it to like-minded individuals who can use it in their own daily discussions and in formulating their own opinions or maybe even recording those opinions and sending them to me via email so that I can include them on the show, as so many of you have done. Now, speaking of this sort of housekeeping uh, business and catching up with the comments, I am, I think, only one new contributor behind, and it's now coming up on a month since the contributions were made, and I think I did make mention of John Ronald's contribution from back on December 24th, but then a few days later it was followed up by another new contributor who uh, is going to you know, make us make me uh, take a stab at the pronunciation of the name, but it looks like uh, Christine will say Bickler, B-I-C-H-L-E-R. I don't want to hazard a guess about anything that might, you know, it might be right, might be wrong. 
uh, my best guess. But thank you, Christina, for joining the ranks back on December 29th. I have this little pink index card. I mean, it just happens. It's not because, you know, it's not for you, Christina. It's for everybody. But but a little pink index card that I'm using for whatever reason. No real rhyme or reason behind the color. But, you know, writing down uh, new contributors who I want to make mention of on the air. And I, it's been sitting here staring at me for days. And each day as I turn on the machines that make the show run, I say, ah, yeah, today I will find time. And then events get away from me. Uh, crazy things happen in the world. We feel like we need to discuss them and discuss them thoroughly. So I haven't been caught up on that, but I appreciate it as always. I like to say people's names, even if I mangle them on the air. I think it, I think it'd be fun to be called out for things like that. And uh, I, we really do appreciate it. I had a thought about a fundraising drive the other day. You know that uh, Gil is constantly needling me for censoring the show, whether self-censoring what I say uh, aloud or going back and bleeping things like when Greg uses his favorite, uh, I don't even know if it counts as profanity anymore, uh, and he loves to do it intentionally. Every once in a while we slip up and do something accidentally. And Gil has always wondered, you know, what do you even bother with that for? It's a podcast. It's not on the radio. Lots of podcasts revel in the profanity and the raw language. And that's what makes people interested and interesting sometimes when they when they talk about these things. And I guess originally it came from, you know, the likeness of this, the way we treat this program and its likeness to radio. And then there was, in fact, for a while anyway, simulcast or replaying, anyway, of the podcasts on regular radio programs in, you know, random areas of the country. And so I wanted it to be sort of FCC ready and for the back catalog, as it were, of our podcasts to also be ready for air and not cause any problems for the licensees of these radio stations should they choose to pick up the show. But it seems fairly obvious, one, that's not likely to happen again. And two, eh, all right, so big deal. Uh, you know, if you play it on your air, <laughs> that's your problem. I don't own the radio station. Anyway, uh, but also, you know, it's just sort of a, it's a challenge. It's fun, actually, sometimes to work around uh, the profanity if you can come up with an alternative expression for it or just make fun of the fact that you're self censoring. But uh, Gil has always said, yeah, just let it rip. Go ahead and do what you were going to do, and we'd rather hear it anyway. And, uh, yeah, maybe that's what I was thinking. Oh, I should make it a fundraising challenge. Like, if we can get it to where there's $2,500 of Patreon or other scheduled uh, contributions coming in each month, then I should just say, all bets are off. And, in fact, I'll go out of my way, or I'll do an all-cursing episode in which no story goes reported without profanity. I don't know. But we could turn it loose, I guess, at that point. And I don't, but I don't know whether that I don't know how to like link that to a real fundraising drive. At this point, I think the subscribers are the subscribers. Though we encourage everybody to join in, and you can if you've been thinking about making a contribution uh, but haven't yet done so. I guess you can tag it as uh, I'm, I'm contributing towards uh, your show in the hopes of freeing the profanity. We would like to have profanity, please profane uh, as many, I don't know, speak profanely on as many subjects as you as you possibly can and do it in the morning over breakfast. So, I don't know. Maybe there are people for that. At any rate, uh, shouldn't we be getting to some stories about now? Why, yes, we should. We effing well should. God damn it. I think we can get away with that one. All right. What are the uh, things I wanted to share with you? Oh, yes, right. Here's news from the Detroit Free Press, although I also saw... Ah, yes, okay. They're crediting CNN with finding the audio that made this report possible. I knew CNN had something to do with it. The Detroit, Detroit Free Press, however, has written it up for us. Michigan GOP chair, uh, co-chair, sorry, sorry. I effing well got that wrong. Uh, S. Uh, he's just using saying S like instead of crap. Is just, all right. Well, anyway, it's stupid. I'll have to come up with some better curses for you. Michigan GOP co-chair says Trump campaign directed fake electors per CNN audio. Oh, well, 
Now we have some coordination alleged here. And if I am not mistaken, I also think on Twitter when I saw CNN credited for bringing up the story, somebody else was saying uh, Rudy Giuliani may have had a personal hand in encouraging this coordinated effort uh, in, in which Republicans filed essentially, in many cases, uh, forged uh, electoral college certificates. The ex- there's an excuse given, and we'll see whether the, uh, the article discusses it, but if not, I can outline for you what their hope uh, is, in if they're ever dragged into court over this, how they'll plead here. Michigan Republican Party co-chair Michonne Maddock, Michon, Michon, I don't know how the emphasis is there. Michon Maddock said that the Trump presidential campaign directed Republicans in Michigan to seat fake GOP electoral college delegates, according to audio obtained by CNN. We fought to seat the electors. The Trump campaign asked us to do that. I'm under a lot of scrutiny for that today, Maddock is heard saying in the audio, reportedly recorded at a conservative gathering last week, according to CNN. In the audio, Maddock does not say whether she personally communicated with officials from the Trump campaign. Maddock did not immediately provide a comment to the free press. The Michigan Republican Party also did not immediately respond to emails. Uh, The plan was part of a quixotic effort to overturn the election in Michigan to hand the state to Trump. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel and her team investigated the acts for possible election fraud charges, recently referring the matter to federal prosecutors. On the day in 2020 that Michigan's presidential electors met to award the state's 16 electoral college votes to Joe Biden, who won the state by more than 154,000 votes, Republicans, including Maddock, tried to enter the state capitol to convene a false slate of GOP electors. Maddock's husband, State Representative Matt Maddock, Republican of Milford, was also present. Law enforcement blocked the group from entering. I remember that the Michigan uh, would-be electors were blocked from entry. Other places let them in, and they met in other rooms besides the uh, various assembly chambers that are usually used for the legislature. They met in side rooms, but uh, they blocked the Michigan people. But that did not stop the overall effort. Michonne Maddock and 15 other Republicans signed a document falsely claiming Trump's victory in the state. That document was sent to the office of Vice President Mike Pence, the Michigan Secretary of State, the National Archivist, and the Chief Judge of the Western District of Michigan, Nessel said earlier this week. So all of the backup locations that a genuine certificate would otherwise have been sent. The document indicates that all but two Republicans nominated to cast Michigan's Electoral College votes had Trump won the state, signed their names. Terry Lynn Land and Gerald Wall, two Republican nominees, did not sign. Instead, the document includes the signatures of James Renner and Ken Thompson. You get to name alternates to the Electoral College, and I'm sure... Well, I'm not sure. I mean, they weren't abiding by any of the other rules, so maybe they just picked them out of a hat or pulled them in off the street, for all I know. The archivist rejected the document, notifying Nestle and others in the process... The documents are also part of the U.S. House's broad January 6th commission inquiry. It's a committee. You can get that right, please. Nestle's office said her office had, yeah, it's office choice. Nestle's office said her office has been investigating the signatory's actions and that she absolutely had enough evidence to bring state charges, but referred the matter to federal prosecutors because she said the effort in Michigan appears to have been part of a multi-state conspiracy to overturn the election, which Republicans eventually will say, no, 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 that was Democrats. Don't you remember? And Chuck Todd will probably say, yeah, I do remember and how terrible it is. Uh, Our hope is that the federal authorities in the Department of Justice and the United States Attorney General Merrick Garland will take this in coordination with all the other information they've received and make an evaluation as to what charges these individuals might face, Nessel said. Recently, the Congressional Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol broadly cited efforts by Trump campaign attorney 
Rudy Giuliani to influence legislators in Michigan and elsewhere. The committee references his attempts in Michigan and other states. He appeared in Lansing in 2020 during a lengthy hearing where he and others presented a litany of false statements about the election. Was it a real hearing or was it one of those fake hearings that were just convened by uh, Republicans? I don't know. They might have had a real hearing there because they, do they not have, I don't know if they have a legislative majority in Michigan or not. Anyway, uh, where were we here? Uh, yes, in the Maddox audio recording, she references her husband and says he fought for a team of people to come and testify in front of the committee. She doesn't reference which committee, but is likely referring to the hearing with Giuliani and others. The Maddox's efforts to meddle in the election didn't end in Michigan. Representative Maddox was among the 15 Republican state lawmakers in the House who sought to join the U.S. Supreme Court lawsuit to overturn the election in Michigan and other battleground states. And Michonne Maddock uh, helped organize buses from the state to head to Washington, D.C. on January 6th, when Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol to stop Congress from certifying the 2020 presidential election. A video from the Right Side Broadcasting Network shows the Maddox both of them, speaking at a rally in the nation's capital the day before the deadly insurrection. We never stop fighting, Michonne Maddox said. She did not expressly advocate entering the capital by force. Okay, fine, sure. But, you know, maybe Rudy Giuliani asked her to do that too, and she just never got around to it. All right, well, that's pretty interesting in terms of uh, establishing the fact that it was a coordinated effort. There's lots of other evidence, but uh, now there's this too. And, uh, okay, great. I won't turn up my nose at it. Let's see. Oh, yes, this information we uh, discussed yesterday about the Ukraine being uh, resupplied in its weaponry by the UK. Uh, let's see, other stories that uh, we should have gotten to in the past couple of days and might have fallen through the cracks. I can probably archive that as well. Ah, yes, here we go. Uh, we're it's just sort of the Friday catch-all, everything else that we uh, can clear out of pocket here. Florida health official placed on leave after encouraging employees to get vaccinated. Yes, you can't have that down in Florida. The Washington Post story by Timothy Bella from just the other day, the 19th, the Florida Department of Health on Tuesday placed a top official on administrative leave after he allegedly encouraged employees to get vaccinated against the coronavirus. What a crime, huh? Paul, oh, I'm saying Paul, not Paul, but Raul. Yeah, okay, Raul Pino. I reversed it, so I was going to say, like, I don't know whether I was going to come up with Paul Reno or not, but Raul Pino. The director of the Florida Department of Health in Orange County sent an email to employees earlier this month that was critical of the agency's vaccination rate. Pino, a leading figure in the public response to the pandemic in the Orlando area, noted that only 77 of the 568 staffers had received booster shots. Okay, at least it's just boosters. And 219 employees had gotten two doses of coronavirus vaccines according to WFTV, which first reported the story. And I guess they reported it that way, which is kind of confusing. What's the difference between people who didn't get boosters and people who only, who had gotten two doses of coronavirus vaccine? Isn't that the same thing? Only 77 of 568 staffers had gotten booster shots. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. And 219 had gotten two doses. So only 219 out of the 568 had even gotten to that level. Does that mean that several hundred had either gotten only one shot or less? Hmm. Okay. I am sorry, but in the absence of reasonable and real reasons, it is irresponsible not to be vaccinated. He even hedges, right? He wrote on January 4th, we have been at this for two years. We were the first to give vaccines to the masses. Okay. We have done more than 300,000, and we are not even at 50%. Pathetic, he wrote, apparently referring to the 219 employees who have had two vaccine doses and not those who had also had boosters. He added, I have a hard time understanding how we can be in public health and not practice it. 
Mm -hmm. That's a good point. We Sam Khoury, a spokeswoman for the Florida Department of Health, confirmed to the Washington Post that Pino was placed on administrative leave. She did not offer details on what led to the decision or how long Pino would be on leave, but suggested that state officials are investigating whether the Orange County official violated state law. Hmm. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis signed into law in the fall a measure that prohibits state government agencies from implementing vaccine mandates. But that's not what he's done. He has said, no, we really, I encourage you to get the shots. And it's pathetic that we're in public health and haven't gotten them. It's not a vaccine mandate. Anyway, as the decision to get vaccinated is a personal medical choice, which it isn't. Uh, we disagree with this. Uh, YouTube, but that's what they're saying down in Florida. As that decision is a personal medical choice that should be made free from coercion and mandates from employers, the employee in question has been placed on administrative leave. So they're not trying to blame it on anything else and just say it's a coincidence. Oh, okay. And the Florida Department of Health is conducting an inquiry to determine if any laws were broken in this case, Corey said in a statement. The department is committed to upholding all laws, including the ban on vaccine mandates for government employees, and will take appropriate action once additional information is known. Well, uh, I don't know what they're going to do with that additional information in Florida. They don't seem to be processing it very well anyway. A screenshot of the email posted to Twitter by NBC News reporter Mark Caputo shows that Pino may have also accessed potentially confidential worker health information. Now, that's something. Okay. Pino, 58, did not immediately return a request for comment early Wednesday. Christina Pushaw, a spokeswoman for DeSantis, said the governor's office was limited in what it could say during an active investigation. I doubt that. The move in Florida comes as U.S. public health leaders are urging caution at a time when the country has yet to reach its peak of the highly transmissible Omicron variant. While the explosion of the cases of cases has begun to plateau in some areas, U.S. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy says Murthy says Sunday, not Murphy, but Murthy said on Sunday that the next few weeks will be tough as the country inches toward a national peak in cases. While Florida is still averaging nearly 50,000 new coronavirus infections a day, that rate is down 22% compared with previous seven-day average, according to data tracked by the Post. 64% of the state is fully vaccinated, which is slightly higher than the national rate of 63% which is terrible. DeSantis, who has opposed vaccination and mask mandates throughout the pandemic, signed a measure in November that prohibited government agencies from implementing vaccine mandates and restricted private businesses from having vaccine requirements unless they gave workers the chance to opt out for medical reasons or religious beliefs. This is the strongest piece of legislation that's been enacted anywhere in the country in this regard. The governor said at a news conference at the time, is it actually a fault for which he should be Held accountable, but it's a bragging point to him. Pino, who has led the health agency in Florida's fifth most populous county since 2019, left Cuba as a political refugee more than 25 years ago. He settled in New England and took on odd jobs, including picking blueberries in Connecticut. Connecticut? Oh, really? The Orlando Sentinel reported Pino, who had graduated from medical school in Cuba, returned to working in health care, eventually graduating from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and being hired as an epidemiologist at the Connecticut Department of Public Health. I wonder if Greg knows him. Since the start of the pandemic, Pino has been a constant presence at coronavirus news briefings with Orange County Mayor Jerry Demings, a Democrat, by the way, outlining best practices and safety recommendations. He has repeatedly urged residents to get vaccinated. But, you know, what does he know? He's a blueberry picker. So it's an interesting story, right? Imagine being a healthcare professional in Cuba and leaving that behind for having to take on odd jobs and fruit picking in the United States until you could, you know, recredential yourself. But he's managed to do it only to get fired by Ron DeSantis because Ron DeSantis hates freedom and freedom stories. There you go. Anyway, He goes on to say, Pino does, clearly vaccines are working for us and are the solution to this crisis. The vaccine continues to be effective against the variants. In his email earlier this month, Pino wrote that less than 14% of Orange County's agency, the Orange County agency's staffers had received booster shots. 
He added that just under 39% of employees had gotten two vaccine doses and about another 6% had only gotten a single dose. Democrats in the state were quick to criticize DeSantis and the Florida Department of Health over Pinos being placed on administrative leave for encouraging vaccination. So he got in trouble for asking his public health workers about public health, tweeted State Representative Anna uh, Escamani who represents Orange County, a Democrat. State Representative Carlos Smith, a Democrat representing Central Florida, was so upset over the state disciplining Pino that the lawmaker tweeted in all caps, it's his job. This is not okay, he added, but not in all caps. Okay, it's important that you know whether it was all capitalized or not. But true, real story and real kind of stupid and, you know, par for the course, I guess, in Florida. Um... We'll note that much, at any rate. Uh, let's see. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I can probably file this one away as well. Uh, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Ah, yeah, more news from around the country. We'll stick to the coronavirus theme for a little bit longer with our break coming up. Uh, I think we can get in the basics of this one from the Salt Lake Tribune, the Senate president there in Utah, apparently. Stuart Adams is apparently his name, and apparently he has tested positive for COVID, and they're pretty sure that he's positive for COVID because he tested positive twice. But then guess what he did? Uh, he tested positive twice on Tuesday before publicly announcing, though, that he was negative and then going to work unmasked for the rest of the day. He So he was positive, took another test, also positive, pretty sure you're positive at that point, but told everybody publicly that he was negative and then went on a super spreader tour of the Capitol. The acknowledgement of his positive tests came after Tribune inquiries and a records request. That sounds pretty interesting. Maybe we'll read through the details of it. I'll check it out over the break and perhaps we'll go further with it uh, afterwards. But uh, man, I just don't understand how you can be in public life and do that. But you could be a Republican. Welcome back now to the KGO in the Morning Show here on Netflix Radio. I'm having a little trouble with the funky mute button again. Ah, all right, well, I'll have to keep an eye on that. Let's see. I uh, didn't get a chance, of course, to dive into the article any further than I thought I would. But uh, let's take a look, uh, see if there are any more shocking details. Robert Gerke reports for the Salt Lake Tribune January 18th. After testing positive for COVID-19 last week, Senate President Stuart Adams opened the 2022 session unmasked, conducting business as normal. And trying to reassure senators and the public, he was fully recovered. Huh. In his opening comments to Tuesday, oh, I see, to the events of Tuesday, Adams initially said he'd tested positive twice for COVID-19 since yesterday. <laughs> he blurted that out. Then backtracked seconds later. Oh, I tested negative twice, he said, joking that he'd misspoken to make sure people were listening. Uh-huh. Uh, I don't know what to make of this. Uh, all right. In reality, the senator had indeed tested positive twice Tuesday morning. After the Salt Lake Tribune made inquiries about the senator's test results and filed an open records request regarding the test results, uh, the Senate was backtracking on Adams' original statement. Uh According to Senate Chief of Staff Mark Thomas, Adams tested negative on Monday, then tested positive Tuesday morning. Adams took a second test, which he thought was negative, but Thomas was notified later that there was, in fact, a faint line on the test indicating it was positive. Okay, so, right? When Adams made his comments on the floor, Thomas said Adams thought he had indeed had two negative tests. Adams made no mention of the positive result that morning. President Adams took COVID-19 tests and had mixed results, which may have caused confusion. Senate Deputy Chief of Staff Andrea Peterson said in her statement, it is not uncommon to test positive days after contracting COVID-19. Well, that's certainly true. And according to the CDC, a positive test after recently recovering from COVID does not mean the individual is contagious. Uh, hmm, I don't know. 
Peterson said the senator has followed CDC guidelines, has not had a fever since Saturday, and his symptoms had subsided. But of course, he's not following CDC guidelines because he's not wearing a mask. Adams originally began having symptoms Wednesday night and tested positive for COVID-19 Thursday morning. I'd say you're probably still in some danger on Tuesday morning if you're still testing positive. You should certainly be wearing a mask. He had planned to attend a news conference Friday regarding the status of COVID-19 in Utah, but did not because of the test. So that he skipped. CDC guidelines state that someone with COVID-19 should isolate for five days and then wear a mask for an additional five days to prevent the spread of the virus. Well, guess what he didn't do? That. So, of course, for the spokesperson to say, well, he followed CDC guidelines. Well, no, he didn't. So don't say that. I mean, it could say in the Salt Lake Tribune, Peterson said the senator had followed CDC guidelines, but that wasn't true. This is what happened. They could have just come out and said that. Adams was maskless when he opened the session Tuesday, according, uh, including when he greeted Elder Garrett W. Gong, one of the 12 apostles for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the, the Mormon church, who offered an opening prayer. Now, the fact that he's an elder doesn't necessarily mean that he's an elderly person. They have very young elders out there. But as it happens, uh, you know, he's a gray-haired individual. It's hard to tell exactly what his age might be. Uh, but uh, the elder was masked, so we have some hope that he will not have passed the virus on to him. There's some chance that Elder Gong will be just fine because he looks like he's got a good high-quality KN95 type mask on. Very wise. Now, somebody else is next to the speaker on the rostrum there, and I don't know who this woman is. Is she identified in the picture? She's wearing what appears to be maybe a cloth mask, and maybe that's not uh, the greatest protection anymore. Although it could be a surgical mask. It's hard to tell the difference. It's a black mask, and it's difficult to tell. They do now make the surgical masks in, se in several colors. So it's not just the blue necessarily. Anyway, um, where were we? Uh, Adams uh, was maskless for opening the session when he greeted the elder from the Mormon church. Adams wore a mask, though, when he met with news media later in the day, but was unmasked again when the Senate resumed business in the afternoon. COVID testing is available to legislators and staff on Tuesdays and Thursdays during the session, but it is not mandatory. Adams told reporter reporters that a handful of staff and interns tested positive Tuesday, but no senators tested positive, even though he had twice. A massive outbreak of the Omicron variant has caused record high case counts and a record number of hospitalizations. State officials have encouraged symptomatic people to assume that they are infected and not get tested to preserve testing capacity. That's unfortunate, but okay. As long as you assume you're positive and then do the things that a positive testing person should do, like isolating for at least five days and then wearing a mask for five days afterwards, at least. Uh, yeah, I have my questions about those numbers, but you can't say you're following CDC guidelines if you don't even do that. The Senate voted Tuesday evening to rescind a Salt Lake County mask requirement issued by the County Health Department and upheld last week by a vote of the county council. Oh, okay. So the local people running the county said we should continue the mask requirement, but the Senate, not the entire legislature yet, voted to rescind a county mask requirement because we know best from top down because that's the way Republicans work. Well, we'll see what happens in Utah. Utah's case rate has spiked and they have like jumped, literally jumped up the rankings in terms of the states with the uh, highest infection numbers, uh, cumulative infection numbers throughout the pandemic per million residents. But they've really made uh, some uh, just leaps up the list, uh, though there was somebody on Twitter the other day pointing out that uh, who cares about case counts? Deaths is what really matters. And Utah, as they say, dead last. This person said dead last in the death, deaths per 
million residents. And they are not, in fact, dead last, but they're way down there. That's true. So it's been very interesting. Their case counts have been pretty high all along. Well, not all along, but through the Delta wave. Delta hit uh, Utah pretty hard, but somehow I guess that's true. They've managed to post pretty good numbers in death rates. But I think that we may be just because of the sheer volume of cases that they're seeing from Omicron in a couple of weeks, uh, we should check back in on them and see whether they are in fact still down near the bottom of the list. As of right now, they do in fact stand at, um, I guess only Vermont and Hawaii are performing better in terms of deaths per 1 million in population. So let's see, they'd be uh, 50, 48th out of the 50 states uh, or uh, 49th out of the 50 states plus the District of Columbia. So, you know, that's something. Uh, They are sitting at 1,254 deaths per 1 million, whereas, say, the top of the list at the moment is Mississippi, where they have seen more than 3,598. They're nearing 3,600 deaths per million to Utah's 1,200. I'd rather be Utah, but, uh, yeah, I have a feeling you're going to start to see a difference because I think uh, Utah has, in the last couple of days, started making the list of most new deaths reported per million, the top 10 list. And so I guess you'll start to see them creep up the list too. Uh, Anytime you see somebody point stuff out like that and say, well, this state or that state is doing great and they're doing great because we don't believe in, you know, masks and mandates and vaccines and the vaccine mandates and all sorts of things like, uh, all all sorts of sciencey stuff like that. You're basically, you know, you're on the clock at that point. You're daring the virus to come and get your state, and it will. And, you know, you might be among those who are sorriest about it, depending on your stance on vaccines. If you've made the personal choice to have your life be put in danger by this wave or the next one. All right, let's see. Other things uh, of some interest here. I had put this piece aside. Although, yeah, should I skip off of coronavirus news or spend still more time on it i wonder um yeah i guess we can jump off of it here at this point the the article i put aside is probably uh, well it's a more of a description of something else happening elsewhere in a podcast so if we can't bring you the podcast uh, no point in bringing you the recap so we'll jump off of that i just thought it was interesting maybe you'll want to you know for if you're into uh if you're into other podcasts which i don't know why you would be uh you might want to pick up on this one uh it's ezra klein's podcast uh which uh, he's beaten me out in the clever naming department it's the ezra klein show which i i'm for that sort of purest thing in naming it. I think that's perfectly fine. Don't bother yourself with trying to come up with something clever or intelligent. Uh, but he interviews one of our uh, favorite sources for just good, solid analysis on, on this and many other things. As you know, Zeynep Tufech, Tufekci is how I'm going to try and pronounce it again. Uh, I never have. Maybe I should listen to the podcast just to hear how her name is pronounced. But anyway, the two of them together, that ought to be pretty informative. And I guess uh, he's writing up a promo of sorts uh, of the of the uh, podcast. And I'll, I'll give you the link. You can listen to it. An hour and 17 minutes with Zainab here. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, it's a pretty good combination. You'll probably get some real interesting information. But the title here for the write-up about it is Zainab Tufekci on... How to Prepare for the Pandemic's Next Phase. Zainab helps Ezra understand the system's wide failure on COVID and how we can prepare for the pandemic's next phase. I would like to know what that phase is. And if anybody's going to guess and have me pay attention, uh, well, Zainab is probably among them. So uh, she's been pretty good with this stuff and I can't really even explain how or why. It's just 
been the case. Just uh, her, her logic is undeniable, I suppose. All right. Let's see. Other things to share with you. Uh, just to switch tracks a little bit and get to other things that have been sitting around in pocket for a little while. Uh, how about this? Why didn't the FBI see the Capitol siege coming? Printed in or running in Grid News, which is uh, yeah, actually a, a name that it's been mentioned more and more, really making a name for themselves like Frederick Douglass these days. I don't know, a new operation of sorts and attracting a lot of uh, journalistic talent from among the ranks of people who uh, merit my notice, I guess, on Twitter. However, I've arranged things. But we might be calling that name more and more. Grid News. Okay. And it's grid.news at that. So that's how you can find it. Why didn't the FBI see the Capitol siege coming? Uh, maybe because they didn't want to. And we'll see whether Jason Palladino gets around to that conclusion in this January 14th piece. A year later, the Bureau still won't come clean on why it ignored piles of evidence and outside warnings about political violence before the attack on January 6th. So he's rather skeptical of their answers uh, when they're questioned about it. In the lead up to the Capitol siege, the FBI received at least a dozen warnings about the possibility of violence that day. And he has a timeline of it that he displays below. When the day came and the Capitol barricades fell, such as they were, it became evident the FBI largely ignored them all. The warnings came from all sides, regional law enforcement, social media platforms, Congress, specifically the House and Senate Intelligence Committees, a top defense official, extremist watchdogs, right wing experts, uh, journalists, and even three different components within the FBI itself. That makes it especially difficult to understand. Grid reviewed every public statement FBI officials made about the Bureau's intelligence leading up to the siege to understand how the FBI explained its posture on January 6th. We read hundreds of pages of FBI briefings and press statements, FBI officials' testimony before Congress, and public comments and news reports. We found that the FBI has given at least five different explanations for why it failed to heed those warnings and take steps to foil the Capitol attack or help other agencies prepare a sufficient response. Some of them support arguments the FBI should get more money and legal authorities, but given what we know now, none of them holds up. They're following the same blueprint as 9-11, said Mike German, a former undercover FBI agent and author of Disrupt, Discredit, and Divide, How the New FBI Damages Democracy. Uh-oh. He is a fellow, and we love fellows, at the Brennan Center for Justice, First, they say, we had no intelligence. <laughs> we can believe that. Then they say, our authorities prevented us from getting the intelligence, which is not true. German echoed the comments of Senator Chuck Grassley, which is rarely a good idea, from a June 2001 Judiciary Committee hearing. Nearly every time the Bureau fails, Grassley marveled, it ends up with a bigger budget, more jurisdiction, and the director walks out of this room with a nice pat on the back. Huh. That's probably actually not a bad comment. This is what the FBI is good at, German said, taking its failures and turning them into opportunities for more resources. The institutional lack of introspection, while unsurprising, is deeply worrisome. German and others agree the threat of political violence, particularly from the right, and targeting democratic institutions and political leaders is higher than at any point in modern history. Many key indicators point in one direction. Extremist violence is reportedly surging and threats against election officials and members of Congress are increasing. The threat of lethality from domestic violent extremist groups is higher than it ever was, Attorney General Merrick Garland told Congress last May. If the FBI remains blinkered to the most serious and likely threats, January 6th might not be its last major failure. American democracy has largely survived the violence of January 6th, and the Department of Justice has undertaken a historic effort to investigate, indict, and prosecute hundreds of participants who might never have stormed the Capitol in the first place if the FBI had heeded clear warnings and taken proper steps to prevent the attack. The Department of Justice did not respond to requests for comment for this story, 
a credible explanation for the FBI's failures around January 6th may yet come from other quarters. Multiple accountability probes into the events of January 6th are scrutinizing the Bureau's woefully insufficient response. The Department of Justice Inspector General has an active probe that reportedly examines the FBI's troubling inaction. The January 6th committee in the House has an entire blue team, as they call it, of investigators trying to answer the questions around the security and intelligence failures that preceded the Capitol breach. A Bureau spokesperson who spoke on condition of anonymity told Grind that while the FBI had information that was concerning about the potential for violence in connection with the January 6th events, the FBI was not aware of actionable intelligence that indicated that hundreds of people were planning to violently breach the Capitol. It would be difficult to believe if you didn't have that much evidence, I guess. Here are the Bureau's five public explanations for failing to take seriously the intel on January 6th and an assessment of the veracity of its claims. First, nothing we saw suggested violence was possible on January 6th. Just hours before the attack, FBI National Security Division personnel assured the acting Deputy Attorney General that there was or were no credible threats, according to an email obtained by BuzzFeed News. Shortly after the siege, the FBI echoed the internal communication, repeating that it had worked with other law enforcement and intelligence agencies to detect potential threats, and no one saw the Capitol siege coming. There was no indication that there was no indication there was nothing other than First Amendment protected activity. Stephen de, hmm, de Atuna, uh, Antuono, Stephen Dantuono. FBI assistant director in charge of the Washington field office said on a call with reporters on January 8th, we worked diligently with our partners on this. Less than a week later, the FBI appeared to contradict itself. We developed some intelligence that a number of individuals were planning to travel to the DC area with intentions to cause violence. The Tuono, De Tuono, and Tuono. Gosh, it's not that difficult, but Dan Tuono told reporters on January 12th, an FBI official told NBC News that agents traveled around to people's homes to dissuade them from attending the protest. To date, no outlet has confirmed the details of any visit. Uh, interesting. And that will, of course, be uh, become evidence in this big spin machine of Ted Cruz's accusation that it was, in fact, the FBI that launched the attack as a false flag operation against true patriots. They were the only ones talking about it ahead of time as opposed to explaining it as well. They were questioning people they had reason to believe were discussing their intentions to do this ahead of time, which is kind of what you want. In March, another senior FBI official repeated the canard that the Bureau had seen no indication of possible violence. In testimony before the Senate Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, Jill Sanborn, assistant director of the FBI's counterterrorism division, told lawmakers, quote, None of us had any intelligence suggesting the individuals were going to storm and breach the Capitol. As we now know, this is not true. Many within the FBI had intelligence suggesting violence related to Congr Congress's election certification. In addition to the many warnings from outside and within the FBI, again, see the timeline he provides, the Bureau should have been privy to alerts on travel to Washington by any one of the dozens of watch-listed individuals who reportedly came to the district for the day of the siege. Hmm. Why didn't that trigger anything? Asked German. Uh, second on the list here, we didn't have sufficient visibility into the violent groups involved. At a Senate Judiciary hearing in March, Senator Amy Klobuchar expressed surprise at the detailed planning the violent right-wing Proud Boys extremist group employed when preparing for its January 6th assault on Capitol Hill. She asked FBI Director for, uh, Christopher Wray if he, oops, everything has shifted here because of a pop-up, if he ever wished the FBI had kept closer tabs on the Proud Boys in advance of January 6th, which they would never have done under the Trump administration anyway. The Proud Boys had left a trail of violent altercations across the country before January 6th, including in Washington, D.C., and were central actors at some of the worst flashpoints of violence at the Capitol that day. Let me also remind everybody that the Proud Boys have never been particularly good at hiding those intentions, 
and like hotel chains in the area were able to detect ahead of time that trouble was inbound and they've canceled the reservations of Proud Boys coming in for various rallies. Uh, I think the one in late December prior to the January 6th, the one that got, uh, I think, was it Enrico Tario arrested, or was it one of their other leaders, arrested for uh, tearing down the church banner and setting it on fire, right? He was in jail for January 6th already, uh, or, or, I mean, on the date. He was in jail for something he did earlier, not for his activities on January 6th. He wasn't able to participate in January 6th. But if the hotel security guys can figure out that the Proud Boys are coming and what that means, why the FBI couldn't do it, well, they didn't want to, is the most likely explanation. The group's members were, as we said, among some of the first to breach the Capitol windows. At least 27 Proud Boy members or associates have been arrested in connection with the attack, with at least 17 indicted on a charge of conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding, according to NPR's database of charged individuals. There must be moments when you think, if we would have known, if we could have infiltrated this group or found out what they were doing, Klobuchar said. Do you have those moments? Absolutely, Ray responded. I will tell you, Senator, and this is something I feel passionately about, anytime there's an attack, our standard at the FBI is we aim to bat a thousand. I wonder if that line of questioning gave rise to Cruz's conspiracy theory. Well, he's just said that he wanted to infiltrate the Proud Boys. We can probably just extrapolate from that that they did and that uh, they planted the seeds of the siege in their minds because they were agents provocateur. But hmm, no uh, evidence of that, actually, to date. But uh, okay, well, yeah. And you might, might wonder why uh, they hang back and not infiltrate the Proud Boys when they infiltrate Quaker peace groups during the Iraq War. And the answer, of course, is... Uh, Proud Boys are Trump allies. They wouldn't want to sick the FBI on them because they wanted them out there um, creating chaos and perpetrating violence on behalf of the Trump administration and campaign. Anyway, continuing with the article here, we now know that the FBI was in regular contact with the Proud Boys in the days and months leading up to January 6th to gather intelligence on left-wing activists. Ah, what do you know? According to Reuters, the FBI cultivated Proud Boys not to inform on their own activities, but to act as intelligence sources about Antifa, a loosely organized group, if it even is that, of anti-fascist street protesters. Proud Boys leader Joseph Biggs faces six criminal charges in connection with the January 6th Capitol siege. He is accused of directing some of the first acts of violence that precipitated the siege, accusations he denies. Two days before the attack, Biggs told a Reuters reporter that he had been talking with the FBI for months and was willing to tell his bureau contact about his plans for the day, if they asked. At least four members of the group had communicated with the FBI prior to the attack, Reuters reported. One member of the group was even texting his FBI handler a real-time account of the attack, according to the New York Times. Another member of the group has pleaded guilty to charges stemming from the riot and is cooperating with the government. The FBI spokesperson told Grid in a written statement, the FBI has no comment on these reports you mentioned. The FBI does not comment on sources and methods. The Proud Boys weren't the only far-right group, violent far-right group, that appeared to plan ahead for violence. The government has identified at least 21 riot defendants as members of or associates of the Oath Keepers, an anti-government militia group founded in 2009 and incorporated in Nevada. The group claims to have... Nope, everything has moved again. The group claims to have, what, uh, 30,000 members and recruits from active and former military and law enforcement. According to federal prosecutors, Oath Keepers arrived at the Capitol in armor and helmets with firearms and radios and forcibly stormed past exterior barricades Capitol Police and other law enforcement officers and entered the Capitol and executing the January 6th operation. Prior to the Capitol violence, members of the militia provided security for Trump ally Roger Stone, 
as first reported by the New York Times. The group's founder, Elmer Stewart Rhodes, oh, he doesn't go by Elmer, <laughs> okay, has, uh, has been subpoenaed by the House Committee investigating January 6th. Rhodes told the New York Times that the alleged Oath Keepers charged in the Capitol breach had, quote, gone off mission and that they entered only to render aid to others. Ah, sure. On Thursday, the Department of Justice charged Rhodes and 10 others with seditious conspiracy, some of the first sedition charges made in the investigation. Prosecutors accused the group of stashing firearms on the outskirts of D.C. to be used in support of their plot. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, the same guy who was just talking to you a second ago. Our Patreon subscription drive is still going strong, with over 175 monthly donors who help keep us on the air. If we've helped keep you going during the pandemic, why not return the favor and help us keep going so we can all be together for the next disaster? Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it easy to make secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for keeping you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We literally could not do this without you. All right, welcome back now to the k in the Morning Show here on Networks Radio. Shall we continue in reading the grid news piece on why the FBI somehow couldn't figure out that January 6th was coming, despite being in contact with many of the perpetrators of the violence on January 6th? Um, we left off by saying that uh, prosecutors had accused the uh, Oath Keepers of stashing firearms on the outskirts of D.C. to be used in support of their plot. But we ran out of time to tell you what the plot was. The plot to stop the lawful transfer of presidential power. Just to put that point on it. Although many Americans first heard of the Oath Keepers in relation to January 6th, the organization is well known to the FBI. We've heard lots about them before then. The Bureau has kept tabs on it since at least 2013. The FBI has identified the Oath Keepers as domestic terrorism sovereign citizen extremists in internal documents released under the Freedom of Information Act to reporter Emma North Best in 2018 and observed that various individuals associated with the Oath Keepers have engaged in well-publicized criminal acts which appear linked to violence and terrorism. So excuse number three here, the Constitution tied our hands. Even though journalists, watchdog groups, and even social media platforms themselves were able to spot the clearly emerging threat, and the FBI itself was reportedly in contact with members of key participant groups in the day's events, FBI leaders have repeatedly told Congress that the Constitution ties their hands, a claim that baffles legal experts. When grilled on the issue by lawmakers last March, the FBI's Sanborn and the Bureau couldn't mo said the Bureau couldn't monitor social media in the absence of a lead or a tip from a citizen or outside agency. Senator Mark Warner expressed his disappointment with the answer, citing the FBI's lackluster response to earlier questions after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville that turned deadly. But according to the Justice Department's own domestic investigation guidelines, agents are allowed to conduct proactive Internet searches of publicly available information to process observations or other information for authorized purposes. In June, Ray seemed to repeat the red herring, telling lawmakers repeatedly that the department regulations forbid agents from monitoring social media. And, oh gosh, another shift from pop-ups. I really dislike this way some of these sites design this, these ad spaces. And uh, this one really shifts, shifts things that you're reading straight off the page. you got to scroll to find your place. Where were we? In June, Ray seemed to repeat the red herring, telling lawmakers repeatedly that department regulations forbid agents from monitoring social media without proper predication. Ray told uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the Bureau did not have the proper predication for and authorized purpose in advance of January 6th to dig into social media posts. 
That's completely false, the Brennan Center's German said of Ray's claims. Their rules are public. You can read them. It's ridiculous that stuff even gets reported or that policymakers don't immediately debunk it. Yowza. Then, excuse number four, it's hard to distinguish intentional posts, which presage actual violence, from the aspirational or mere bluster. Mm -hmm. At the same June hearing, Ray described the difficulty the FBI had determining whether threatening online posts were aspirational versus the intentional. There is all kinds of just unspeakably horrific rhetoric out there across the spectrum, and trying to figure out which individuals are just using hateful, horrible language with no intent to act versus which ones actually have an intention to commit violence, Ray told the committee, especially in a country where we have the First Amendment and there are all kinds of policies that the Justice Department has had in place for years and years and years that govern our safe space and uh, or our ability to operate in social media is a real challenge. Hmm. Well, that's just wrong, experts say. Andrew Weissman, former top lawyer for the FBI, called Ray's explanations stingy and deeply unsatisfying in a joint op-ed. Weissman and his co-author, law professor Ryan Goodman, pointed out that the FBI routinely takes actions to prepare for highly sensitive events such as the January 6th certification of the Electoral College results. Indeed, wrote Weissman and Goodman, although Ray did not mention this to lawmakers, the FBI's role in preparing for such events allows the Bureau, in accordance with the Attorney General's guidelines, to engage in proactively surfing the Internet to find publicly accessible websites and services through which the promotion of terrorist crimes is openly taking place. What is clear, the two concluded, is that the FBI knew enough to take further action, but failed to do so. Because it wasn't Muslim terrorism. In fact, two recent cases suggest the FBI does believe it can distinguish between the two and bring charges against speech it finds intentional. One example is the case of Daniel Baker, a self-described leftist from Florida. Baker wrote on Facebook shortly after January 6th calling for armed civilians to help defend the Florida Capitol building against potentially threatening far-right groups. He was recently sentenced to 44 months in federal prison for the posts more than most Capitol rioters will face, including those who made specific threats against members of Congress and traveled with weaponry to D.C. Wow, that seems wrong. There's a long history in this country of police, prosecutors, and courts targeting anarchists for trumped-up charges and excessive sentences. This legacy goes back to Haymarket and continues to today, with Dan's case being the most recent example. Brad Thompson, a civil rights attorney at People's Law Office, told The Intercept. The FBI's approach of de-emphasizing investigations of white supremacists and right-wing militia violence while targeting resources at social justice movements and calling that extremism has existed for some time. Hina Shamsi director of the American Civil Liberties Union's National Security Project, told D. Smog earlier this year. Another example involved Missouri activist Mike Avery. Another, after Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin murdered George Floyd in May of 2020, Avery posted calls to action on Facebook. Avery encouraged people to gather outside the Ferguson, Missouri Police Department to protest. Soon after, FBI agents showed up at Avery's home and arrested him. Huh. They charged Avery under the Anti-Riot Act, a 1968 law that is rarely invoked, like sedition, I guess. According to the affidavit, Avery's Facebook posts were spotted by FBI agents online who were attempting to identify potential flashpoints for violence by monitoring social media for imminent acts of violence. Well, gee, I guess they can do that. The FBI cited a post where Avery encourages people in the St. Louis area to gather for a red action, whatever that is, in all caps, and specifically encouraged shooters to turn out, which the FBI believed was encouraging people to assault police officers. Avery's attorneys argued that shooters is a slang term for men and that Oh, really? Okay. And red action is a commonly used term in activist circles to describe protests that may involve pepper spray, rubber bullets, and other crowd control measures. That could be. 
I don't know about shooters as men, but okay. According to reporting by NBC News, Avery was one of four people charged on incitement to riot charges based on social media posts. His charges were dropped several weeks later after Avery was held without bail. To date, no capital insurrection defendant has been charged with inciting a riot. Huh. This case, though dismissed, shows the willingness of the FBI to proactively arrest and detain individuals it saw as planning violence on social media. The FBI issued joint intelligence bulletins to law enforcement agencies in 2020 based on social media activity before demonstrations over the killing of George Floyd, protests in Portland, and Black Lives Matter protests in Washington. The FBI issued no such bulletin prior to January 6th, according to a Senate report on the insurrection published in June. It was not until January 13th, a week after the attack, that the FBI issued a joint intelligence briefing warning of possible continued violence. Since the January 6th event, violent online rhetoric regarding the uh, the January 20th presidential inauguration has increased, the FBI document says, citing open source reporting, which they can't do, or something like that. And then finally, our tools failed us, number five on the list. Of bad excuses, the FBI claims it needs better tools to sort through social media data. The volume, as you said, the volume of this stuff is just massive, and the ability to have the right tools to get through it and sift through it in a way that is, again, separating the wheat from the chaff is key, Ray told lawmakers in June. Last October, unnamed sources with apparent deep knowledge of the Bureau gave potentially more detail to Ray's claim The sources told the Washington Post that an end-of-the-year changeover from one social media monitoring service, Data Miner, to another, Zero Fox, left the Bureau blind to obvious threat indicators online. The FBI has never made this claim publicly and for attribution. German dismisses it out of hand along with the Bureau's other excuses, which profess a lack of intelligence or awareness of extremist threats before the Capitol siege. It just doesn't fly. German said of the FBI's complaints. For starters, German noted, news media were reporting threats of violence in advance of January 6th. Even if FBI leaders are somehow unable to see the threat information reported up from below, they can certainly read the front page of the local paper. On January 5th, 2021, the Washington Post ran a story headlined, Pro-Trump forums erupt with violent threats ahead of Wednesday's rally against the 2020 election. The article noted that the forum members discussed potential bloodshed and advice on sneaking guns into D.C. What's more, Zero Fox apparently has a history of aggressive social media exploitation to identify potentially violent threats, one that suggests the FBI's criticism of the service's thoroughness may be misplaced. Unfortunately, Zero Fox's apparent zeal appeared as misdirected as the FBI's could be. Instead of focusing exclusively on actual violent threats, the company appears to have aggressively probed and reported nonviolent progressive protest organizers. In April of 2015, amid protests and rioting in Baltimore following the death of Freddie Gray in police custody, Zero Fox sent Baltimore city officials an unsolicited report that labeled prominent black activists with large Twitter followings as threat actors, according to Mother Jones and the Baltimore Business Journal. Under a section of the report titled Threat Actors, Hashtag Most Wanted, the report listed movement organizers DeRay McKesson, Janetta Elzey, and others as physical threats subject to, quote, continuous monitoring. Wow. The report, which was subsequently released to media through a public records request, categorized both McKesson and Elsie as severity high, in all caps, the word high, and threat type, all caps, physical. Really? From DeRay McKesson. I don't know anything about uh, Janetta Elsie, but I'm guessing that uh, it's about the same, which is ridiculous. Uh, I know a little better about DeRay McKesson. Jeez. The report was, which was subsequently, uh, oh, right, we did this one. Zero Fox said uh, they were not only high severity and physical threats. They said in its report 
that they were among 187 influencers and 62 actors the company was monitoring ahead of the protests. More than a year after Zero Fox's report, FBI agents visited McKesson's home and the home of some of Elsie's relatives to ask questions. The two told Grid it could not be determined if the alleged visits were prompted by Zero Fox's reporting. This is just so insane to me. Who would look at my photo and think, oh, she's a threat, Janetta Elsie told Grid. I never incite violence. If anything, I documented the violence of the police, said Elsie. I care more about people's safety than the police did at the time. When the FBI agents came calling, Elsie said her aged relatives trolled the agents hard. They've lived through Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. as uh, the brackets fill in. I mean, her own speech, of course. She just refers to Malcolm and Martin, you see. They know about the FBI, Elsie said. They asked, why did you kill MLK and made its agents uncomfortable? The FBI spied on King, of course, and in 1964 attempted to convince the civil rights legend to kill himself. According to emails obtained by the Baltimore Sun, Zero Fox CEO James C. Foster sent the report to contacts in Baltimore City government on April 27, 2015, saying he had immediate intelligence to pass along. Our system also supported the New York City Police Department during their riots and protests, Foster wrote. The alerts and data are alarming, and we briefed our classified partners at Fort Meade this morning. Foster and Zero Fox did not respond to requests for comment. In a public address the day before the anniversary of the siege, Garland delivered a speech vowing to hold accountable the many people involved in the day's events and planning at any level. Noticeably absent from the 3,316-word speech was a recognition that any responsibility for the day's events could lie with the Bureau or that the lens of accountability could be appropriately turned inward on his department. Asked what the Bureau had learned from the insurrection, the spokesperson replied, The FBI has increased our focus on swift information sharing with all of our state, local, tribal, and territorial law enforcement partners throughout the United States. We also have improved automated systems established to assist investigators and analysts in all our field offices through the investigative process, which is, you know, gobbledygook, doesn't tell us very much. Okay, now... Uh, displayed is that timeline that he referred to earlier. I don't know if it pays to read through the items on the timeline. I guess so. Maybe uh, we'll begin with November 20th, 2020, when an email from an FBI analyst at the Bureau's Hazardous Devices School in Huntsville, Alabama, to colleagues warns of post-election violence from the far right. Militia groups are espousing increasingly violent rhetoric, the email warned, expressing a new level of escalation by declaring, the fight is now. Hmm. Late December 2020, the New York uh, City Police Department uh, sends a packet of material to the FBI, full of information indicating that there would likely be violence when lawmakers certified the presidential election on January 6th. December 21st, in a viral tweet thread, an amateur Israeli-based right-wing monitor warns on January 6th, armed Trumpist militias will be rallying in D.C. at Trump's orders. It's highly likely that they'll try to storm the Capitol after it certifies Joe Biden's win. I don't think this has sunk in yet. <laughs> I guess it didn't. The next day, December 22nd, right-wing social media platform Parler sends the FBI three screenshots from a user who threatened to kill politicians. That's extraordinarily uh, responsible of them. December 24th, Christmas Eve, in a bulletin to law enforcement, the private intelligence analysis firm SITE, S-I-T-E, Intelligence Group, states a supposedly violent insurrection by Trump supporters has always been the plan. The group quoted another online post which stated, Patriots who, now all caps, still at this point in time, are too cowardly to condone violence, are part of the problem. It needs to happen, although it's, it needs to expletive happen. And you know how we are about expletives. It, th th this report just says ex the word expletive. You know. Anyway, early January 2021, I guess well before the 6th, though, by the start of the year, larger social media companies in Silicon Valley were also flagging scores of posts daily to the fusion centers in Northern California, the Washington Post reported. 
for companies to reach the threshold to report its users to law enforcement. Such posts typically imply violence or the use of a weapon. Mike Cena, the Fusion Center director, told the companies his office couldn't keep up with the surge and asked them to start sending the concerning posts directly to the FBI's analysis center in West Virginia. January 1st, amateur D.C. historian Elliot Carter, whose Washington Tunnels website includes information on the Capitol Complex's underground tunnel system, files a report on the FBI's website about a flood of visitors to his site from outside the D.C. area, many from right-wing sites. Carter says some of the visits came from posts on those sites about January 6th. On January 2nd, Parler sends along more posts to the FBI, including a series of posts by a user making threats about January 6th. This is the final stand where we are drawing the red line at Capitol Hill. I trust the American people will take back the USA with force and many are ready to die, the user wrote, adding, don't be surprised if we take the hashtag Capitol building. It has to throw a hashtag in there, right? Parler ultimately forwarded more than 50 instances of incitement and violence to the FBI in advance of January 6th, according to CEO George Farmer. Now, January 4th, Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner reaches out to the FBI to share concern about the threat of violence on January 6th. He was alarmed after hearing reports from his staff of widespread online chatter of violence surrounding the January 6th ceremony, the Washington Post reported. He wanted to make sure the Bureau was seeing the threat and to learn what it was doing to counter the danger. David Bowditch of the number two, the, oh, the number two official at the FBI, heard him out but did not sound concerned. Don't worry, he told the senator. The FBI is on top of it. Oh, well. No wonder he's upset. Also January 4th, on a call with cabinet members and top security officials, Joint Chief of Staff General Mark Milley asks why federal officials were allowing protesters on Capitol grounds given the threats against congressional leaders, according to the Washington Post. Milley noted that extremists had begun boasting on social media that they planned to come armed and attack lawmakers. January 5th, NBC News runs a story with the headline, Violent Threats Ripple Through Far-Right Internet Forums Ahead of Protest. Also on January 5th, the Washington Post runs a story with the headline, Pro-Trump Forums Erupt with Violent Threats Ahead of Wednesday's Rally Against the 2020 Election. Also January 5th, we're running out of time, so a lot of things will be on January 5th. FBI Norfolk transmits a memo warning of possible violence that day. January 5th, in an alert to members obtained by transparency group Property of the People, FBI liaison groups with transportation firms, uh, FBI liaison groups with transportation firms, here we are, highlight the chance for violence on January 6th. Law enforcement and security professionals warn that violence is possible at the demonstrations. It says, noting that an online comment asking when armed Americans would, quote, seize D.C. and start hanging politicians had received 1,100 upvotes. That reminds me there that wasn't there an effort with the FBI to coordinate with transportation uh, uh, firms and turn around buses and planes and other things bound for D.C. in advance. Was, did it happen in advance of the Black Lives Matter protest in June of 2020? Maybe. I can't recall. Anyway, a senior staffer on January 5th for the House Intelligence Committee emails the FBI to ask for information about the Bureau's assessment of threats and its interagency coordination for January 6th. This matter is of high interest to the committee, states the email obtained by BuzzFeed News, especially in light of recent press reporting suggesting that individuals possibly with links to violent extremist groups may be involved with violence or criminal activity in the vicinity of the U.S. Capitol or in relation to the event. And the last entry for January 5th here, an email from the FBI's Seattle office, also obtained by Property of the People, notes that people are traveling armed to Washington, D.C. for January 6th protests. Well, it doesn't look good, that's for sure. Um, I don't think it's a surprise to anyone, but a well-documented piece, and glad we had some time to read through it. All right, let's see. 
other things that we might be able to squeeze in uh, along the way. Ah, you know, I was holding on to this and uh, never used it even when Joan was here, but I thought she made a good observation. I should have credited her for it then. We'll do it now. Um, noting that um, uh, in, in response to a Burgess Everett tweet on the anniversary, on January 6th, the coolest thing about Officer Eugene Goodman is that he's still doing the same job he was doing a year ago, protecting the Senate. And Joan, in anticipation of the filibuster fight, notes, he likely saved Senator Romney for inju from injury or worse. And in return, Romney is helping to filibuster legislation to preserve and protect Officer Goodman's right to vote. Good point. And, uh, yeah, I only wish it had been persuasive with people, but you know what we're up against. Ah, all right. Well, anyway, um, it's, uh, yeah, getting towards the end of the show. I don't think we're going to be able to squeeze in any more of the long form pieces that we have available for sharing. But, uh, okay. At any rate, uh, just wanted to see, peek around whether there's anything I can send your way to read on your own during the uh, weekend, but I think we've kind of covered everything. All right. Well, at any rate, that uh, 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 the other things that occurred to me that uh, were widely reported on social media in the last day or so, I'll try and make notes to myself to find the uh, tweets that can lead to this, but let's see. Small flap with Lauren Boebert yesterday. Reportedly, she encountered a group, a tour group being led to visit their congressman's office, a tour group of Orthodox Jewish folks, whether they are modern Orthodox, just wearing the yarmulkes, or whether they were Hasidic Orthodox with the long beards and everything else. I don't know. That wasn't made clear in the initial reports. Uh, but uh, I guess the best spin for Bobert you can put on it is that they might have been modern Orthodox. Uh, at any rate, she encounters them in the house office building at one of the elevator bays and observing that they are clearly a group there attending together. Uh, they, she quips, she says to them, uh, joked that, oh, uh, are you here on a surveillance run? Are you conducting surveillance or um, uh, reconnaissance of the Capitol complex? Because, of course, you know, she was accused of leading a reconnaissance, similar reconnaissance mission to jazz it up a little bit, leading a tour group of people who showed up the next day for the January 6th riot, a tour on January 5th of the Capitol complex. And that was kind of highly suspicious to a lot of people. So she thought it would be funny to, I guess, say, oh, you mu you're a tour group. You must obviously be here for reconnaissance because all tour groups are. I can kind of understand the sentiment. However, uh, a number of the people in the group apparently had no idea what she was talking about and were a little bit disturbed and were a little bit on edge because of the uh, hostage situation at the temple in Texas just a few days before. So they were a little confused by what she was talking about and a little off put by the whole thing. Her claim, by the way, is uh, I didn't know they were Jewish, which, you know, whatever. And then people were like, well, they were like Orthodox Jews. You probably would have noticed, say, the yarmulkes. Her excuse for that is I'm too short to be able to see anybody's yarmulkes. Not like you can approach from an angle and see. Uh, you, know, you don't have to be above people's heads to figure out that they're wearing Yarmulkes. But it sort of reminded me that uh, just the other day, another flap with uh, Marjorie Trader Green making the rounds on social media as well. That similarly, uh, I guess she was asked about, you know, her various trials and tribulations, but she was saying it really hurts her feelings when people say that she has been accusing, you know, uh, making the accusation about Jewish space lasers. She says that's very hurtful to her because she's never said the word Jewish space lasers. Uh, other people put that together, of course. She's simply saying, I heard, you know, this is the amazing thing. It's like, she's not saying, I never said anybody had space lasers that they used to set forest fires. I just didn't, I'm only denying that I said that they were Jewish space lasers that were setting the fires. And then, of course, somebody asked her, I gotta know whether they had the discussion with her or not. But anyway, they were like, well, what you said was that the Rothschild family 
had paid for and stationed space lasers in orbit and and set forest fires. I mean, it's crazy for you to say that forest fires were set by lasers from space in the first place. But, yeah, you said the Rothschilds had uh, financed this thing. And her thing, her response is, well, I didn't know the Rothschilds were Jewish. That's the one. Now I was making the accusation. Oh, okay. No one ever told you any of that. But it, it makes you wonder. I mean, you know she's into such crazy conspiracy theories, but it, it, if you even give her the benefit of the doubt, and you know all over the conspiracy sites, they, they explain pretty clearly that the problem is with the Rothschilds is that they are Jewish. That's the whole point of the conspiracy theories. But at any rate, uh, they also don't have space lasers. But uh, she claims not to have known that. That snuck up on me by surprise. Besides, I love Israel for cannon fodder. I love plotting the death of Israel so as to bring about the, the apocalypse and the rapture. But okay, I never found out that they were Jewish. But I did believe that they had space lasers and they used them to set forest fires. I mean, it's just incredible. The, the, the parts that I verified of my conspiracy theories are equally crazy. I just didn't check on the Jewish part. Yeah, I don't think so. Neither one of them. They were both caught by surprise by the fact that people From were Jewish. Radio.com. You have been listening to K-Grow in the morning with David Walton. I have? Okay, well, that's good news. And better news than that, the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is back. How do you like that? Welcome back to the air, Justice. Hope you're feeling well. It's just knee problems. Big knee problems with that. But it's not COVID or anything to worry about in the other respect. Okay, that's good news. Stay tuned for this news and more next.